I'm going to talk today about, um, actually it's the relationship between gender differences in occupation and gender differences in pay and compensation. They're clearly uh, related, so I hope to uh, convince you. Uh, so, I start out by posing a question. So, why has so much been said uh, and written about gender inequality in both the popular press and in academic research? Okay, and what, so why is that? What's the basis? And my answer would be arguably social concern over gender inequality in occupational outcomes uh, is driven mainly by a very close association between occupational inequality and income inequality. Okay, that's what I would argue is the basis for social concern and academic interest. And to give you sort of a counterfactual, what if it were the case that women were underrepresented in low paying jobs, dead end jobs with no promotional opportunities? Would it be a social issue? Well, at least for women it wouldn't be. Maybe men would have a problem with it, but women would not. So the concern has to have something to do with the fact that the kinds of jobs women are concentrated in uh, do result in uh, lower pay compared to men. That's my argument of why uh, we have this concern. And I would say that equality of opportunity is probably a universal goal. I think everybody across the political spectrum would say yes, we should have equal opportunity. Uh, what gets divisive is equality of outcomes. That's where people start to differ. So some feel, well, we ought to have equality of outcomes. And if somebody, you know, has an eighth grade education, they shouldn't be punished for that. Uh, and others would say, well, if that's their choice, uh, that's the consequence. And people will argue back and forth uh, about that. And so what will my lecture uh, explore? Well, I want to look first of all at the association between job titles, occupation, and wages. That's the first thing. And secondly, um, how much of the difference in wages uh, between men and women within a firm, okay, and this is important, I'm going to stress this a lot, within a firm, uh, can you blame on segregation in the workplace? Because I'm going to point out, once you start to look at uh, the more popular type of data from surveys, it's really hard to infer from that how much is really unfair and, and how much is in some sense a reflection of gender differences and preferences. And none of us have been able to uh, answer that question convincingly. But once you go inside a particular firm, you know a lot. Um, okay. And then I want to look at gender differences in mobility within a firm. Okay. And uh, I'm going to use two sources, um, empirical sources, that I think are very interesting and more informative uh, than just looking at household surveys. And the first source uh, is based on an actual court case um, of a company in the United States that was a supermarket that was sued under American law for discriminating against women in terms of their job placement and lack of promotion. This data is fairly unique. I think I will we'll count here at least five papers that I have published using that, that data. It, it, it's, it's really a, an insight into what goes on in a company. Uh, and the second source of information for my talk comes from controlled laboratory experiments that were just run in Paris um, in, I think, November and part of December at the University of Paris, uh, the first, okay. And in those experiments, we were looking at gender differences in occupational choice that's based on picking a risky job versus a safe or secure job. And the risk is the risk of being unemployed. And we have a laboratory setting, which in our experiments, there's no labor market discrimination. So it's clean, okay, you'll see. And the only source of a wage gap between men and women, uh, there's only two sources. Uh, one is productivity, and you'll see we, we give the subjects an actual task 
to perform and they get paid according to their performance. And the only other source is if there are gender differences uh, in picking secure versus risky jobs because we have a premium that compensates a bit for risk. So if one tries to avoid the risk, you get lower wages, but then you experience less uh, unemployment. Okay? And we get some very interesting results from that. So if you go back probably historically, there was probably a time where uh, companies could openly pay women lower wages than men for doing the same work. I mean, at one point, it would not have been an embarrassment. It would not have been illegal. And certainly in the United States, at one time, firms were very explicit about paying black Americans less than white. They'd even have a sign, if you're black, this is what you get paid. And if you're white, you get paid this. Okay, So that's in an earlier historical period. Uh, but times have changed. And when people get paid different wages, like men and women, for doing the same work for the same employer, that's what we call pure wage discrimination. And I'm going to argue that in this day and age, that form of discrimination is not very common. In the data, it looks like it is, but I can explain why it appears that we have pure wage discrimination when, in fact, uh, we don't. So um, in the absence of uh, uh, gender-based equal employment uh, opportunity laws and social pressures, then you, know, you would find pure wage discrimination. It, would, it could flourish, and it did at one time historically to the extent that men and women would overlap in doing the same work. Um, and what would offset that? Well, you would think unionism would offset that. Unions don't like to have workers competing with one another. Um, and the fact that you could pay one group of workers lower wages undermines, as far as the union's concerned, it undermines the wage structure. Um, and, uh, but even in this case, there's a sort of a tension if there's a group that's marginalized in society, it would be women. In South Africa, I'll give an example, it would be blacks. Um, there is kind of a tension between the union supporting lower wages for a marginalized group um, and paying more equal wages but implicitly recognizing social equality. The tension is that if you allow the employer to play, pay women or blacks less, that starts to undermine the dominant group's standing. Okay? And if you pay them on a, on a, on a uh, parity, uh, then the problem is you're implicitly recognizing the social, uh, social equals. And that was the case in apartheid South Africa. So you had mines. You, and you had unions representing miners. The miners, some were black, some were white. And there was always that tension where the union, which was white dominated, they didn't like the idea of blacks getting paid the same wages. On the other hand, they were concerned that if they're paid too low a wage, they start to look more attractive to the company than the whites. So there was always that, that tension in South Africa in the, in the union movement. Um, so. After you have equal pay laws, in the immediate aftermath, what you would find employers doing, seeing evidence in the US, is they would uh, play games with the job titles. So you might have a type of job, let's say accountant, and suddenly now there's two types of accounting jobs. One's called accounting A, and the other's called accounting B. They basically do the same thing, but A pays more. So you'd find men who are accountant A, and women would be assigned to accounting B. And that way it would appear, if, if you're blind, I guess, that um, there's, no, uh, there's no pure wage discrimination. You know, it's not the same job title, but of course it's basically the same job and the distinctions are just marginal. Maybe one job you empty the waste paper basket and that's going to justify, you know, a 15% pay advantage for men. So you would find that, that practice. Um, and. Uh, minor differences in the job tasks, and women would be assigned to the lower paying job category. And another uh, legal means for trying to lower the earnings of men, it was common in the United States, uh, were to have what they called protective laws, protecting women. Uh, as far as I could tell, it protected women from earning higher wages, because there were laws that would restrict 
the hours a woman could work, types of jobs, and all of that. And, uh, but it basically advantaged the men. That's been very well uh, documented. Okay, those laws no longer exist. They were struck down uh, as uh, basically illegal and unconstitutional. <laughs> and um, so then what happens is you have equal employment laws and they take a very careful look at this job labeling. Okay, and so then it's more difficult to, to just um, juggle the titles. So now you have to have men and women doing substantially different work. And that's how we come up with what was called men's work and what's called women's work, okay? They're occupations that are fairly distinct and the men are in the higher paying ones and the women are in the lower paying. So yeah, it's an example of discrimination, but it's not wage discrimination because it's not the same, it's not the same work, okay? And so pure wage discriminations, I argue, is fairly rare. So what that means then is the problem is shifted to gender gaps in wage rates, okay? and earnings that come from occupational segregation. That's how I think it happens. And I think I can, you know, uh, document that. It's that men and women are not doing the same kind of work. Okay, but if you read the newspapers, that's not the impression you would get. The newspaper would say, this year, maybe, I don't know, Luxembourg, uh, women earn 65% of what men earn. In the public's mind, that means, oh, well, they get paid 65% of the wage a man gets for the same job. And that, again, that's not how it, how it happens. Um, so we have this phenomenon of men's work, women's work. They don't overlap. Um, and you have differences in promotional opportunities also. So that starts to produce this gender inequality in occupations, OK? Um, and when you look at the, this micro household survey data that's very popular in all industrial countries uh, where you're interviewing households and you're asking questions about what their wages are and what their jobs or occupations are. If you try to statistically analyze that, it will appear in the data uh, that uh, men and women are getting paid uh, differently for doing the same work. But what it's actually reflecting is the fact that women uh, may tend to work for lower paid, uh, paying firms than men. They may be doing the same job in a low paying firm that a man in a higher paying firm is getting. In the data, it looks like they're doing the same work and just getting paid differently, but the fact is uh, they, they have different employers, in effect, okay? So you get uh, predictable uh, patterns from this kind of data. Um, so when you control for their occupation, that's very common, although sometimes controversial. And it even goes back to my, my thesis work. Um, when you control for occupations, some would argue, but that's where the discrimination arises and you're taking it into account now as something justified. Um, and uh, so what happens is the more detailed the job title is, um, the smaller the unexplained discriminatory wage gap gets, right? I mean, um, if you had a broad category and you called it, uh, you called the occupation working, well then you'd say there's no segregation. Men and women are in the same occupation and any wage gap you observe must be the result of uh, pure wage discrimination. So that's just an extreme counterexample, okay? But the finer uh, the job title is, when you control for that, then what looks like discrimination just starts to vanish. It's because men and women are not doing the same kind of work. So, um, and my view is it's not a particularly interesting question to see if men and women who do the same kind of work get paid uh, differently because I, it, it just doesn't happen uh, that often. And uh, there's some evidence I'm drawing on on some recent work by uh, researchers. Um, they were using Portuguese data, so one of the researchers is David Card, and he's at the University of California at Berkeley, and Patrick Klein is also a colleague of his, and then Ana Cordoso, she's Portuguese, and I think, I think Ana may now be in the UK. She, I forgot where she, um, she moved to. But they were using this Portuguese data where they're able to really look at the characteristics of individual companies and their workers, and that's, uh, that's a nice data set. And they found some evidence 
that women tended to be concentrated in, uh, in jobs in firms that pay low wages, okay? And the men tended to be more likely to have high wage employers. But it isn't that they're doing the same job in the same company and getting paid differently, okay? And then um, another argument, and they make this argument in the paper, and I'm not sure how general this is, and I don't think it is that, that general, but the argument is, well, you know, maybe women don't bargain as effectively as men for their wages. But when you think about it, I mean, there are some occupations where you do that. Uh, certainly in American universities, uh, one at some point starts to bargain for their wage and uh, threaten to leave. But I think in most jobs that most people have, that's not really an option. It's not like you could step into the workplace and start talking to the employer uh, about um, you know, what your salary is going to be and that the employer would actually make a distinction between a male and a female doing the same work and paying a, a lower wage because the woman would accept it where the man might, might not. And so I, I don't, uh, you know, I think that's probably uh, overemphasized. I don't think that happens uh, that often, the types of jobs that most people have, but I'll throw it out there. Um, so, in, in, in principle, one should be able to take a salary difference and you should be able to divide it, that's where the decomposition comes in, into different components. You've got a wage gap, you're looking at it and you're trying to figure out, so where is this coming from? So, some of it is going to come from what economists would call productivity differences. Usually we don't measure productivity directly, that's pretty hard. But you look at things that are related to productivity, like education and ex work experience, that sort of thing. And you look for gender differences in that. And you say, well, that could explain some of that gap. And then some of it could be pure wage discrimination, but I'm arguing that's pretty rare. And in the company that I look at, uh, there, it's zero because it's a unionized company and they have union wage scales. And there's no way the union wage scales permit men and women to earn different wages apart from seniority. That, that's very important to unions that seniority, uh, you know, with more seniority you earn a higher wage, but that's gender neutral. And then how much is due to occupational segregation? And that can occur in a unionized environment, and that's what I'm going to show you. Um, and, you know, conceptually it may seem difficult to make this sort of decomposition even at the level of a firm. But I can tell you, when you go to the general labor market and try to do this, it's almost impossible. So you will observe gender wage gaps. You will observe in a general labor market, men and women uh, are not in the same occupations. Um, the occupational distributions are quite distinct. What you will not be able to say is how much of that is differences in preferences versus women being denied opportunities. We know both are probably present, but it's so hard to actually identify. But when you're at the level of an actual firm, an individual firm, and especially one that's getting sued for discriminating, in which evidence is brought into court, that sharpens it. That makes it very clear where, where it's coming from and who's responsible. So that, um, okay. <coughs> And again, this is what I was saying. Your inferences about how much uh, job segregation creates a wage gap uh, really depends on how fine a detail you're looking at in occupational codes, okay? Because again, the more narrow the definition, <clears throat> the less discrimination you will find within that occupation in terms of wages, okay? So that's, that's pretty well known. Um, Okay, so hierarchical segregation. This is what we worked on, one of the papers we worked on with this firm that was sued and, and, and lost. And that's present, and the way you can identify it, and I'll, I'll actually give you some real numbers from this company, uh, is if you look at um, the proportion of women who are in a job, particular occupation, and if you divide it by the proportion of men who are in that occupation, if as you climb up the occupational ladder that ratio falls, that's hierarchical segregation. So um, you just 
organize the job codes in a hierarchy and say, well, what percentage of women are in this job divided by what percentage of men? And as you move up the hierarchy, the higher paying jobs, you'll see that ratio get smaller and smaller. In this particular case, we reach a hierarchy where it's zero. There are no women uh, in, in the highest job title, at least until the lawsuit. Um, okay. What would cause that? Well, one explanation is, well, you know, it could be, see, we always think of employers as the only source of discrimination. And over my many years of studying this, I know that employers are not the only source. And in many cases, I don't even think they're the major source. It comes from other, other sources. One that comes to mind is discrimination by fellow workers, okay? So, one theory of hierarchical segregation, of which there's some data to support it, is men do not like being supervised by women, okay? Now, I'm supervised at home, but I've gotten over that. So, in America we say, I'm cool with that, okay? But uh, in the workplace, I guess, uh, the feeling is that men do not like being supervised by women, okay? Or at least to be in a subordinate wage position. That creates some pressures on an employer. An employer who otherwise wouldn't care, <clears throat> but now they have an incentive to do something about this because the male employees are going to be unhappy and maybe the cost of doing business is going to go, uh, go up, okay? So um, here are the advantages for examining a specific firm. I've kind of gone over it a little bit, but you can get very detailed information about the internal dynamics that actually goes on in a place of employment that you cannot learn by these general labor market surveys, of which I've used a lot in my own work. But this is better, I think, for getting at what we want to. And um, you can sort out how much of the gender gaps are due to these components that I talked about, um, discrimination versus differences in job preferences. And when you have an actual court case, there are witnesses, there is evidence, okay? It's no longer uh, speculative. Um, and I remember one of my colleagues, who I respect very, very much, uh, in this court case, I said, well, they documented the women were seeking promotion and uh, were denied promotion. And what happened, uh, and I'll, I'll mention this a little bit later, it was something called, and maybe unique to Anglo-Saxon law, it was, um, what's called a class action lawsuit. And the way that works is maybe three women uh, are, feel they're discriminated against and they bring a lawsuit. And their lawyers will usually ask the court to make it a class action. And what class action means is if the employer is guilty of unfair practices, it potentially affects not just the three women who uh, launched the case, but in the Walmart case, it could potentially affect 1.5 million, okay? So that means if the company loses, uh, not only are they gonna compensate the three women, they're going to also have to make adjustments and back pay to maybe 1.5 million women, okay? And that's called a class action uh, lawsuit. Uh, companies don't like that. They'd rather have a big company against three women rather than a big company that's facing really 1.5 million, okay? So uh, my colleague, I remember in this class action suit, he said, well, yeah, but maybe all the women didn't want to get promoted. And I said, they didn't give them a, a lie detector test, right? I mean, the presumption is you have this pattern of discriminating against women. It potentially affects them all. And, uh, you know, so, uh, I, and all the evidence is brought into court. I mean, what, you know, what more do you need? Um, so. When you look at the general labor market, people will say, well, isn't that more representative than just a single firm? Well, a single firm, there's no reason to believe this firm is terribly atypical. It's, it's, it was a supermarket. It's unionized. It operates in a, in a, a regional uh, economy. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it, uh, there's some, something to learn from it and to generalize. And... Um, you know, in the, in the broader labor market, it's really hard to know this. I mean, it's hard to know how much is, uh, you know, preferences, how much is uh, segregation that's forced on, onto women. And so that's the advantage, I think, of this uh, single firm data. And uh, so 
This is based on work that I've done with a series of co-authors, and if you count these, these are five papers from the same data set, you know. Uh, so we, we have uh, fully exploited. I mean, maybe I could think of something else to do with the data, but it's kept us occupied uh, for a while. Um, okay, and it, it, the case rose in a historical period, it's 1978 to 1986, but the circumstances of the case are identical to current cases, identical. It's true of the Walmart case and, and, and other cases. It's women being denied promotion, being assigned to lower, uh, to lower uh, paying jobs, same, same thing. Um, so, uh, and then you, you, know, you ask, well, how can this happen if the company is unionized? Aren't unions supposed to uh, uh, prevent that? Okay, well, this lawsuit was filed in 1982. The firm was found guilty in 1984. The supermarket, as I mentioned, is unionized. So you say, well, I don't understand this. It's a union. Uh, don't they protect women? And um, we had intimate knowledge of the wage setting process. We read the union contracts. We know exactly what the wage structure is. We don't have to speculate. Okay, <clears throat> you know, many of us in this profession in economics use arcane statistical methodology to force a confession from the data. You know, we do torture data, but here we actually know the true wage structure. We've got the union contracts. We know exactly uh, how people are, are, are compensated. And um, we know that the pay gaps do not result from men and women getting paid differently to do the same work. That you can rule out. Uh, the, uh, the contracts are very specific. The only basis for different wages in a job is seniority. That's it. It's all that matters. Okay. Um, okay. But the employer has the right to put whoever they want in the job. Okay. The union doesn't have that right. They only want to make sure that the union scale is being paid. And here is an example of how the firm is organized. Okay. And if you look at the uh, the box with the dots. Those are all hourly wage workers. They are all represented by the union. When you go above the box, you're dealing with management, okay? And what's interesting is there's a lot of job segregation. So, for example, uh, the food clerk. Well, the food clerk is more, uh, these are the people at the cash registers when you buy your groceries. That was something like 54% women. But that was the main occupation in, where, in which the company drew their management. These are the managers, the high paid guys. And uh, until this lawsuit, there had never been a woman manager, okay? Even though the company draws the managers, they don't hire from the outside, they promote, but only men. And then if you look over here, like uh, in the meat department, meat manager, meat cutters, those are male jobs and they pay well. And then the uh, meat wrapper, that's female. That's a female job, pays low. No chance for the women to, uh, at least until the lawsuit, uh, to move up here. Uh, produce manager, all male, no female. So it goes on like that. And um, I also did put together a table, okay, that shows you the hierarchical nature of this segregation in this company. So if you look at this, uh, the top, oops, the top uh, occupation here is really the bottom of the ladder. But I did this deliberately. So if you take the ratio of the fraction of men who are in that hierarchy level one, it's the lowest, to the ratio of women, or it's the ratio of women to ratio of men, excuse me, it's like a factor of uh, 1.3. Uh, but as you move up the hierarchy to the higher levels, um, you, you see that that ratio gets smaller and smaller. You get to the highest, H6, that's store manager. The ratio is zero. There is absolutely no women at that level, okay, at least until the lawsuit. After the lawsuit was filed, suddenly there were three. There had never been any women managers in the history of the company. So even that convinced my colleague that something must be going on. He said, in the entire history of the company, you didn't have one store manager and you get them from an occupation that's over half women, okay. But this demonstrates the hierarchical nature, okay. And then uh, how do you measure occupational segregation? Well, there's an index, 
the Duncan Index. And basically what the index is, it's a measure of what percent of men or women, doesn't matter, would have to change their occupations in order to have complete equality. That's the measure, okay? And um, the scale ranges from zero to 100. If it's zero, it means you have complete equality. Nobody has to change occupations to have equal distributions. If it's 100, it's the opposite. It's complete segregation. There's no overlap, okay? So uh, in this company, before the lawsuit, that index was uh, roughly 56%. What that meant is that 56% 50 of the men or women had, would have to change their jobs, their occupations, to have equality. After the lawsuit was filed and before it was settled, already the company started making changes, okay? It was too little too late as it turns out, but that index then dropped to 33%, just overnight. They changed, you know, the occupational distributions by promoting women, um, and so only at this point a third of the men or women would have to change in order to have full uh, equality in occupational distributions. Okay, so um, we have um, the distributions before and after, and I don't know if it's easy to see or not, but if you look uh, in the first couple of columns there, this is before the lawsuit, uh, you will find when you start to look at store manager, you'll find like 4% of the men were store managers, but none, none of the women. Right after the lawsuit and the period just following that before the case finally got fully settled, you see suddenly there were some women, finally. And, uh, and the proportion of men who were store managers, now that fell, okay, because now the distributions are getting more equalized. So that just gives you an example. Um, and if you just looked at the wage gaps in this company, you'd find, well, on average, women were paid 4.4% less than the men. Is that a big number? I don't know. But if you adjust for the fact that the women actually had more experience and more seniority, that discriminatory wage gap jumps to 13%. And there's a note of caution in this, because again, in the public mind, suppose we had a, a job situation and we find men and women are getting the same, most of the public would conclude there's no problem here. Then you look carefully and you see, well, on average, uh, the men have an eighth grade education, and on average, the women have 16 years, and they're getting paid the same. So that completely changes one's impression about what's going on. So we find that that gap jumps to 13% once you take into account the fact that women actually had more seniority and experience than the men did. And then when you adjust for job titles, see the gap then gets smaller. And in fact, we found that if you only looked at job titles, uh, the gap shrinks to a 2%. You would conclude, well, what's the problem here? Women are just, you know, once you control for the job, uh, women are underpaid by about 2%. But of course, they're in the lower paying jobs. And when you control for the job, you're, you're accepting that as legitimate. Okay. Um, okay. So I put this in today's dollars, uh, in, in euros, I'm not sure. In today's dollar, the wage gap was $1.50 in favor of men. In euros, what would that be, about a dollar or 1.3 euros or something like that? Okay. And, <clears throat> and then if we try to decompose this using these econometric data torture techniques, what do we find? Well, if there were no occupational segregation, the men would have actually earned $2 less an hour than the women. The women were more qualified. But once you take into account the occupational segregation, that gives men a $3.17 advantage, you see. So it more than offsets the less productivity that they have or less experience, okay? And so um, if you look at the wage gap and you kind of net these things out, you get like 47 cents an hour and it's just a combination of segregation and qualifications. But the, the important takeaway here is that occupational segregation counts for a massive part of this wage gap we see. It's due to the being in different jobs, not getting paid differently for the same job. Okay. And then we thought, well, how can we generalize this? So we looked at, uh, we went to one of our uh, 
one of these micro surveys, as the current population survey, 2011, and we said, well, let's apply these methods to workers who work in the public sector, and it's unionized. We looked only at unionized worker in the public sectors, and we found something very similar because we would argue in that sector there's no pure wage discrimination. Men and women in the public sector who work in the same job, you know, they don't get paid different wages. So their average wage gap was $2.87 an hour. And we found that even there the women were more qualified than the men. In the absence of occupational segregation, the men would have earned 53 cents an hour less than the women. Uh, but mind you, they're earning $2.87 more. That's because of segregation. Even in the public sector, that's $3.66 an hour premium to men because of segregation in the job, okay? And so, a very similar <clears throat> pattern that we find in the single firm. Okay, so then the question is, why didn't the unions look after the interests of men? And I, my good friend, uh, Dominique Muirs, some of you may know, she's a French labor economist. She says, uh, is the union dominated by men? I said, yes. She says, that's your problem, okay? Um, they didn't look at the interests of women, but we could see why when we read the, the contracts. The union requires only that the employer pay the union wage scale. They don't care who you pay it to as long as it's the union wage scale. So they don't care who's in the job. And then what happens is if a worker is promoted to management that I showed you on that chart, they're not even in the union anymore. So the union has absolutely no incentive to get involved in, uh, what do we say in, in America? I don't have a dog in this fight, okay? They're not interested. Um, so I think Dominique was appalled by that, but, uh, and I don't know if it's different in, in, in Europe, but that the union's incentive was not to get involved, okay, and they didn't. Um, okay. Now, from the firm's perspective, why are they going along with this? Well, it could be fellow worker discrimination. Men don't want to be supervised by women, but we think there's another reason. And... Um, the other reason is that we find that women are less likely to quit because quitting costs employers money when you have turnover. So one thing they can do <clears throat> is the men are more likely to quit. They put men in the higher wage jobs. You get paid more, that discourages quitting. You put women in the lower paying jobs because they're not going to quit anyway. And so what happens is the firm economizes on these turnover costs. It increases their profits. It's amazing, but that, that's kind of the, the incentive they had until somebody took them to court, okay? Okay, now I'll turn to the Parisian experiments <clears throat> and, and then try to conclude here. Um, so in these experiments, we're trying to look at gender differences in their attitude towards taking risk in a job, okay? And one form of risk, I mentioned unemployment, but another form of risk is Suppose you have jobs that involve a considerable amount of education, okay? You have to invest a lot. You know, if there's some possibility you're not going to be successful, <clears throat> that might discourage one from making that investment. And if women are differentially discouraged, uh, then that's what you're going to find. <clears throat> They're not going to um, uh, invest as much as men because they figure that the payoff isn't uh, maybe really at, at, at serious risk. And, um, and then we're looking in the laboratory at unemployment risk, okay? How, how, does, how do men and women differentially uh, respond to the um, chances of being unemployed and not, um, you know, not getting paid at all? <clears throat> and you would think as long as, you know, there are some people that have this risk aversion that a labor market would establish some compensation so that the risky jobs will pay a higher wage when you're working, but you're running the risk that you're not going to be working as often. And some have argued that's one difference between public sector, private sector. Public sector, uh, the chances of, of being unemployed are less than in the private sector on average, okay? And <clears throat> so some argue, well, that's why the public sector pays less than the private sector. And if women, tend to be in the public sector uh, more frequently than men, that could account for some of the wage gaps. So that's sort of some of the things that we were thinking about. Um, so uh, we decided to run laboratory experiments. 
Okay, and this is based on joint work with uh, Seon Jung, who's currently in, still in, in Paris, uh, and Chung Choi, who used to be uh, with uh, SEPS here. And <clears throat> so in the laboratory, we have tight control. The one thing we will not have in the laboratory is labor market discrimination. So that's not in the picture to cloud things up. There's no pure wage discrimination. There's no forced segregation. Okay, so in our experiments, the subjects are given a typing task, and I'll show you what it looks like in a moment. But uh, in this typing task, <clears throat> um, they can perform it in a situation where every period they're guaranteed the opportunity to type and make money, or in a situation where uh, there's a chance in our experiments, a 30% chance in any given period you're not going to be allowed to type. We'll call it unemployment, and you don't get paid anything. But we, but we create a, a, what's called a risk premium. We pay uh, a higher wage for typing in the risky job. When you get to type, you earn more. Okay, and uh, so uh, and these are piece rates. So one's paid according to their performance. Okay, and um, so the only source of a wage gap in our experiments, there's only two sources possible. One is if there's any difference in the typing performance of men and women, that could cause a wage gap, or selection into jobs. If there's a gender difference in taking the risky job as opposed to the secure one, that would produce a wage gap. And that's all, okay? So the secure job, one's earnings depend only on their performance, okay? There's no risk of unemployment. The risky job earning depends on two things. It depends on performance and chance, and the chance is 30% chance in a given period you're not going to get to type and you're not going to earn money that period, okay? Okay, and we give a little uh, unemployment uh, benefit. Uh, that was mainly uh, Sayun's idea. I think she was feeling sorry for, she said, well, you know, if they're unemployed, you know, you, you give them something. So I think they got one euro or something, you know, and um, that's fine. That's more like unemployment benefits anyway that we find in our labor markets. Um, okay, so the first treatment we did is we take half the subjects and half of them are randomly assigned to take the risky job. The other half get the safe one. Then in the second treatment we reverse it. If you had a safe job the first time, you're now assigned to the risky. If you had a risky job the first time, you're now assigned to the safe. We do that because we want the subjects to experience both of these. Okay, the third treatment the subject picks. What do you want? Okay, you pick the risky job, you already know the compensation involved. You take the safe job, secure, you know what the compensation is. That's what we do. And then we even varied how much we're going to compensate for risk, okay, called the risk premium. Okay, now what do the subjects have to do for earn a living in our laboratory? Well, they had to speak French, of course, because this is in Paris, but uh, they had to type these randomly generated blocks of five letters, okay? So it's not fun, it's not like French poetry. It's not, so it's not a lot of fun to type these things. And they get paid uh, in terms of how many blocks they type correctly. And they have 90 seconds to type in each period, okay? So they face up to 40 random blocks of five letters. So their performance can range from zero, didn't get a single one right, to 40, which is perfect score, okay, and things in between. And there's 10 periods in each of these trials, and the subjects are given 90 seconds to get the job done, do the best they can, okay. This is what they see. <clears throat> you have to figure out what's in French and what isn't. Uh, initially, it was all French to me. Then I looked closer and I saw blocks of letters with no vowels in them, and I said, oh, it must be Welsh, okay. But, but it turns out they, these are just the random blocks that we had the computer generate, okay. But this is what the subjects see, and they have to do their, their little typing. So we had 192 subjects from the University of Paris the first, 103 men and, let's see, 89 women. So roughly balanced, okay, but that's how we recruited them, because we wanted a good balance of men and women. Uh, and they ranged in age from 18 to 48. Now, 48 is kind of interesting. Sometimes France is considered, for some purposes, a Latin country, but it's not Latin America. Because in Latin America, you, you, you might find students who are still, like, age 48, still in school. Um, but we don't find that 
too much outside of Latin America, but apparently at University of Paris the first, there are people uh, who are up to 48 years of age. And what we find in our experiments, 75% of the men picked the risky job when they had a choice versus 60% of the women. So you got a gender gap there, and women picking the safer but lower paying job. And the average performance, the men were slightly more productive. They, on average, would type 24 blocks correctly, and women, 22. It's pretty close. I was kind of surprised by that. I mean, why would the men type? Maybe they play more games on the computer. I'm not, I'm not sure why that is, but it's not a huge difference, but it is a difference. And here's the breakout. So if we look at when the risk premium was like six cents in euros, where we pay six cents more if you're in the risky job for each block you type than in the secure job, we got uh, a gender wage gap of uh, 47 cents euros. But 27 cents was the productivity advantage of men. But 20 cents of it was the job choice. So that's almost, you know, it's getting close to half. And then when we increase the risk premium to seven cents more, if you take the risky job, at seven cents more per block, uh, then you find the, pro the, the gap is like 49 cents in euros. Uh, 23 cents is the productivity advantage of the males. But 26 cents is the uh, job choice that women picking the safer job. So you find overall that uh, the choices of women for the secure job can account for almost half of this gap. Now, if you go out into the natural economy, labor market, uh, the job choice wouldn't account as, uh, for as much. And the reason for that is that you know, we have discrimination. We have job segregation. In the, see, in our laboratory, that's, that doesn't happen. So in the naturally occurring labor market, you know, uh, the job choice wouldn't account for as much as it does here because there would be segregation that's forced on women, like in this court case where it was documented. Okay. So I'll just summarize. So uh, first takeaway is gender wage inequality has more to do with gender inequality in the occupational distributions than it has to do with pure wage discrimination. Okay. Uh, secondly, um, if we look at the level of the single firm, which is my preference, we can't always do that because we can't always get the data, uh, much of the unexplained gap goes away if you take into account that men and women work in different occupations. If you take that as justified, yeah, that starts to make the, the wage gap shrink, and, it, and then it looks fine, except you're ignoring the fact that women are in the lower paying jobs. Um, and then occupational segregation, it can arise from both discrimination in the form of male workers not wanting to be supervised by women, and it can come about through preferences, as we saw in the laboratory. But again, in the general labor market, it's really hard to determine the relative importance of these two. You need these actual cases. Um, and that reminds me, when I've talked about some of this research in France, you know, I've talked about in these court cases, they have expert witnesses, economists, that actually testify in court. They give evidence. And I asked if that happened in France, and my French colleagues told me, no, uh, French judges think they know everything, so they don't, they don't rely on economists typically to come into the courtroom and testify and give evidence. But it's very common in the U.S. for economists to actually appear in court and to testify and to analyze uh, the data. Um, okay. Um, so again, I just said this, in the broader labor market, it's really hard to know uh, how voluntary is this occupational segregation. We know there might be some voluntary aspect, and some of it is pure, unequal treatment, but it's hard to know how much. Okay. And, uh, and again, the single firm example, the court ruled the firm was guilty um, against, uh, for discriminating against women, putting them in lower paying jobs and not promoting them. Okay. All the evidence was brought, you know, it's all brought out. Each side can line up their experts. It's all, all you're ever going to know is brought out in that courtroom. And once the court has decided, that, that becomes, uh, you know, the, the, the final, um, you know, uh, step in this process. Okay. Okay, so um, th and this is what I said before. You can have fellow worker discrimination or 
the employer, in this case, taking advantage that women have less mobility. Economists call that monopsony power. So the women are not as mobile, and a firm could take advantage of that. But it's hard to pay women a lower wage for doing the same work. So the only way you can do this is you have to put the women in the lower paying jobs. So I'll, I'll stop at this point. Thank you. Thank you.